Ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is Peter van der Bel. I'm from the company Hoosgauer Micron BV in the Netherlands. And I would like to share you today some information about our newest development, which is called active freeze drying. The contents of the story I want to share today uh, is a novel technique for freeze drying. As a start, I would like to explain something about the nature of freeze drying, and then why would you use this freeze drying uh, as a drying method. Then I will go on with the current method of freeze drying, which is called uh, tray freeze dryer. And in the end, of course, I will come to our new technology, which is called active freeze drying technology. Uh, freeze drying or lyophilization is the combination of freezing the material to be dried and then to remove the solvent um, by sublimation. Sublimation is a phase transition of the liquid as a frozen state directly to the gas phase. Um, this technique uh, is already invented or used uh, by the Incas about 600 years ago. What they did, they, they put their food store, their food material in the mountains, very high, and the material froze, and due to the low pressure, the low uh, vapor pressure off of the water at that altitude, the material dried very slowly, and it gives a very good preservable material. Over the last 100 years, this technique uh, is transformed into an industrial technology. First, uh, it became wide, widely known by, by the, the Second World War, when the blood plasma for the Allied soldiers were, uh, was preserved in this way. And later on, during the NASA, the NASA uh, space program, the astronauts also used this technology um, for their uh, preservation of the food. So they use freeze-dried food in, in space. So why would you like freeze-drying? Uh, of course, it's to dry very difficult materials. Uh, difficult materials can be, for instance, thermosensitive materials, so materials which cannot have a very high temperature. It can also be fragile materials, or also called structured materials, like uh, maybe cells or maybe some, some plant material. And lastly, also for very fine powders. And for fine powders, you have to think about nanomaterials. Uh, on this picture, you can see some, some different applications of those food materials. First of all, herbs. You can see the nice colors. If you dry herbs in a traditional way, you will see that the green color will become very yellow and the red color will become very brown. If you use freeze drying for these kind of materials, they will preserve their own natural color. And upon, if you add some, some moisture again, they will get the same fresh look as they had on the, on before. The same is for, for onions or garlic, um, and also for meat. If you have freeze-dried meat, it looks more or less like normal meat. If you add water, you have your original meat again. So it's an ideal food, not only for astronauts, but also for camping. You know. The next slide, you can also see uh, a close-up from, from onion, which is freeze-dried. And it really looks like, well, fresh onion. The only thing you have to add is water, and you have your same uh, onions again, which look and taste like onion. Uh, this picture shows you um, the basic uh, uh, phenomena around it, this, this uh, freeze drying. You see a cell on the left side of a plant cell. You can see there's a lot of moisture inside. If you would dry this on a traditional way, like let's say uh, atmospheric, you can remove the water through the cell wall. Uh, the cell will shrink, and in the end it will collapse completely and it will be a flat part of material. If you do it with freeze drying, it will be a little bit different because then the material in the cell will be frozen. The, the cell cannot collapse because there is a kind of ice structure inside. You can remove the water just by sublimation, and in, in, in the end, you have still the same, um, well, same volume and the same type of plant cell left. If you add water again, it will go into the cell, and you will have the same material again. Well, the same counts also for bacteria, which is shown on the right side. And there you can see that the cell was much, uh, much weaker. So therefore, it's even more difficult to, uh, 
to remove the water without collapsing of the cell. But then also free join can, can have an advantage here. Finally, also the nanomaterials. You can see some pictures here. On the left side, you see some spray dried material. So you can imagine if you have a, a dispersion of nanomaterials in water, for instance, you spray dry them, you have droplets containing a lot of small particles. Uh, upon drying, the, the droplet will get smaller and smaller. And in the end, the particles get so close together that it will form a very hard agglomerate. If you do the same in freeze drying, uh, the ice structure in between the particles will prevent particles getting together. And until the end of the drying, you still have separate particles. Of course, if you then later have to collect them, they can combine again, but then the, the forces between particles are much smaller. So the, the product quality will be much better. Well, this picture shows you some of the, the basic uh, phenomena around freeze drying. If you look, for instance, at the, the pressure on the left side of about 1030 millibar, which is about atmospheric pressure, if you have ice below zero, uh, if you start increasing the temperature of this material, around zero degrees it will start melting and you get a liquid. If you further continue with this, uh, with this uh, heat in, uh, input, so you increase the temperature it will go to 100 degrees, the liquid will start to boil, and above 100 degrees, you will get the vapor. This is what you call normal drying. If you would do the same uh, at the very low pressure, let's say below 6 millibar, you still have the ice. If you increase the temperature, you can see at a certain point, you will cross the line, uh, going to the light blue uh, area, and you will directly go to the vapor. So there is no liquid phase at all. And this is really the key thing of freeze drying, just avoiding this liquid phase, that material can get uh, a different shape or a different form. So it's uh, one of the important things. The other thing which is also important to realize for freeze drying, um, if you have this very low pressure, let's say, um, for instance, one millibar, you can see that one kilogram of water has a very large volume. If you look in the, in the diagram, you can see it's about, uh, well, 12, 1300 uh, cubic meter. So even if you go to 0.1 millibar, it's even uh, more than 10,000 uh, cubic meter. So this means that the equipment you have to design has to handle this enormous volume of water. Well, one way of, of dealing that uh, is shown in this process flow, on the left you can see the freeze dryer, so where you have your frozen material. If you start sublimation, you have an enormous flow of vapor, which has to be handled by your equipment. So what you do is, in the freeze condenser, which is shown uh, in the middle, uh, you try to, to freeze most of the ice or the vapor, which is uh, the ice which goes to vapor, and then if you freeze it there, the, the, the left uh, volume of process uh, which has to be processed is, is can go to the vacuum pump, uh, which is a very small one. Uh, so the, the key thing here is you just have to freeze most of the vapor. Well, finally, what you can see here is another aspect of freeze drying. In this picture, you can see uh, an, a graph of, of uh, different drying methods. So on the, on the, the bottom side, you can see the capacity of this drying method. And on the left side, you can see the product temperature, which will be reaching this kind of drying uh, method. So for instance, if you look at vacuum drying, it will operate to, uh, let's say, 100 degrees. And it has a moderate uh, capacity from, from 10 to 100 kilogram power uh, evaporation. If you go more to the right, We'll see the flash dryer, and of course, if you go to disk dryers or fluid dust bed dryers, they can end up with a very high capacity at very high uh, temperatures. Well, in this graph, you can also see the freeze drying, which is on the far left corner, which means that it has a very low capacity, and it can only handle very low temperatures of product, of course. Uh, but this is something you have to realize. Well, knowing this about uh, freeze drying, Here we are showing you a picture of a conventional freeze drying system. This kind of system has been developed over the last 100 years. Uh, in the picture, you can see the, the pink uh, part is the, the freeze dryer itself. You can see the shelves. If you put your material on those shelves and you start cooling uh, those shelves, the material will freeze. At a certain point, your material is completely frozen. You can close the door and then you can pull vacuum. The vacuum pump is shown on the right. And in the middle, you can see this uh, freezing condenser where you can remove most of the, of the vapor. So in this process, what you do is you start heating the shells. You can add some heat. The ice on the shells will sublimate. It will go to the refrigerator, of course. It will condense. And the leakage air and then the small amount of vapor will go to the vacuum pump. 
So it's a very stationary process. What you can all see is that you have to handle a lot of shells. It has to be filled. It has to be emptied. And of course, there are some more disadvantages. Uh, first of all, yeah, the advantage of such a system is, of course, it's a known technology. As I said, it has been developed over the last 100 years. The other one is because it's a closed system with no moving parts, you can reach a very low end pressure. But of course, there are many disadvantages. Uh, yeah, again, the intensive handling, so you have to fill those trays. Sometimes if you have to put a liquid inside, for instance, uh, you have to be very careful. And if you look at the number of trays, it can be, be hundreds of trays which has to be filled. Well, after drying, of course, you have to empty those trays, so you have to take them out. Sometimes you have to crush them, which means it's a lot of yeah, exposure of operators to this product. In the case of pharmaceutical products, of course, this can be a problem. Well, the freezing time it can be quite long because the, the freezing is, well, the, the, the material on the shelf is not moving, so you have to freeze it very carefully. Uh, well, the product is not moving again, so it also has a very low drying rate because it's very difficult to get the heat into. And then again, the post milling, crushing eventually. So there are some, some disadvantages like handling product damage. If you grind too fast or too intensive, you can, you can damage your cells or whatever. And again, the contamination. You can see it uh, more in, in pictures. On the right, you can see uh, one of the larger freeze dryers available. You can see the enormous number of trays which has to be put in. And on the left, you can see an operator taking out the trays from, uh, from a somewhat smaller dryer, showing some nice powder. So this comes to the final part of our presentation, and also the more important one. So why would you go to active freeze drying? Uh, what we call active freeze drying is because it's in dynamic freeze drying conditions, so we have no longer have the stationary trays, and this kind of condition will result in some benefits. First of all, easy handling, because we think we can have much easier handling, so we can avoid all the trays which has to be filled and emptied. Uh, we can also make the process faster, just by having a more heat transfer, so we can have a better heat transfer of heat into the product, so we can have faster evaporation. And finally, we can also change the product quality. Because sometimes if your product bulk density is not okay, we in our system will have a different one. And the same counts also for particle size distribution, uh, or sometimes dispersibility. Survival rate if you talk about bacteria. And lastly, look for crystal structure. So our process is listed how it works. We have a single machine where we can mix our liquids, dispersion of solids, so whatever you want to prepare. If you want to make a dispersion of bacteria, you can do it in the machine. Uh, then you start combining the, this liquid with a kind of uh, freezing medium, which will result in the granular structured ice. The second step is uh, you start drying, so you close your machine, you pull vacuum. Um, since the material is moving in the machine, you will have a very fast heat transfer. Um, and then finally, if the material is still in the dry, you can add something to post mix it if it's finished. And in the end, you can just open the valve in the bottom and you can take out your materials. So as it's written here, you can see it's, it's a lot of less handling than compared to the traditional ones. This picture shows you a little bit different uh, schematic drawing of our system. So we have the material to be dried. We have a freezing medium. They are combined in a drying chamber. Uh, in this chamber, uh, we produce a kind of granule ice, of frozen material. Um, we start adding sublimation heat. Well, this, this adding of sublimation heat is very effective because the material is moving inside. The vapor which is formed uh, will go to your condenser and then go to your vacuum pump. The product sometimes really moves together with the vapor and can be collected separately. Sometimes it stays in the dryer, but this can be controlled in our, uh, in our system. Wherever the product is, either in the drying chamber or maybe in the product collector, after finishing the drying, you can just empty this, uh, this part and you have your product. If you look uh, to the process, uh, how it functions, so we start, if you look at the red line, which is the product temperature, we have ambient temperature in our machine. Uh, you put it in the machine, we introduce our freezing medium, so very quickly the temperature will go down, depending on the type of freezing medium, of course, you use. Uh, you get your ice structured uh, granules. If the freezing is okay, you will close your machine, you start vacuum drying, and then the, the product temperature will get this, uh, this temperature, which is connected to the, to the pressure at the, at, in the dryer. Well, then you get your primary drying for a long time. At a certain rate, when the 
or the product is more or less dry, you can start increasing your jacket temperature so you get some more heat input. You will see that the product temperature will increase a little bit, and in the end, when the drying is finished, both the product and the jacket will have the same temperature. And you can see that your drying is finished. There are some more realistic uh, graphs of the same process. In this case, there are two drying uh, performed. If you look at uh, the pink uh, points, which is the, the condenser temperature, the blue ones and the green one are, uh, are the, well, the, temp the, the pressure inside the chamber. So you can see that slowly the pressure will go down. Sort of, uh, if you look at the green one, it's the pressure really inside the chamber. So in the end, you can see the pressure goes down, indicating that there's no evaporation anymore. If you look at the temperature uh, um, evolving uh, inside the chamber, the, the yellow one is a, is a jacket temperature. So we have the primary drying where the jacket is very constant for a, level, for a longer time. At a certain point when you see that the pressure goes down, indicating that the, the, the drying is more or less finished, we start increasing the jacket temperature. Or you see that also the product temperature goes together with this jacket temperature, indicating that it's hardly any sublimation. At a certain point, you can decide that the product is, uh, is dry. Here's a picture of how the process goes. In this case, uh, you can see uh, pouring in of the liquid, which has to be dried into the machine. On the right side, you can see the introduction of the, the freezing medium. This is uh, the frozen material after freezing of the material. So this is just not, not dried, uh, but just to show you how the granules uh, look. Of course, for the drying, it's better to, to the smaller the granules, the better, of course. There are some different granules. On the left side, you can see a porous one. On the right side, a more solid one. And this kind of well, structure can be controlled by the, the choice of the, of the reading medium. Another aspect, what you can see, is if the dryer is filled with, uh, with frozen granules, and you start drying, you can see that the volume in the drying will go down because the, the water sublimation or the solvent sublimating, uh, the level goes down. And in the end, you can see that the dryer is more or less empty. Also an indication that the drying, of course, is, uh, is finished. This is a picture of the inside of the product collector. Here you can see the, the very fine, now in this case, nice white powder. Uh, after finishing the drying, you can just open the, the bottom valve of this collector, and you get your product. So there's no handling at all, actually. Here. Well, to conclude, uh, more or less, this, uh, this introduction. So active freeze drying, as we call it, uh, is if, yeah, similar to our normal uh, tray drying system. Of course, it's very suited to dry difficult materials. So again, thermosensitive materials, fragile materials, very fine powders, so nanomaterials, pharmaceuticals, and also to produce some, uh, some more specific crystalline substances. I can show you some pictures of this one. In this case, on the left side, you can see a product which is dried in the tray dryer. Um, it's just a solution. In this case, you can see a very, well, large structured crystals, simply because the freezing in the tray dryer goes relatively slowly. So you can build very large uh, crystals. On the right side, you can see the same product if you dry it in, a, in our active freeze drying. And because the, the freezing goes so much faster, you can see more or less amorphous product. And next page, you can see the same with a little bit closer look. So you can see really the difference in the, the crystal structure. And of course, this will also result in difference in the particle density and also particle size. So here's a listing of our uh, applications, so this is most of our tests we did so far. To show you something, uh, bacteria are okay. Uh, we did some, some with different organic and inorganic salts. Um, well, enzymes, we have very good results. Of course, yeast, mushrooms, to make your mushroom extracts, some herbal and uh, extracts and also herbs. Well, milk is a very good product. Nanomaterials, we did several tests for that also. They were all very successful. Or well, vegetables, of course, but yeah, again, depending on the price for the soup, uh, soup will be very expensive in this way. Uh, proteins, flavors, they're all different kinds. Insects. So we have many different uh, tests done so far, and what you see uh, are the successful tests. So it's a very wide range. Well, this more or less concludes my presentation. Uh, of course, you must have many questions by now. So I would say, if you have more questions, please inside US contact uh, Mr. Sua Ozzy. And outside here, you can contact Mr. Roland Wiesinger. I would say thank you for your attention.